evening, everyone. My name is Karen Tucker, and I'm CEO at the Churchill Club. Welcome. This is a very special occasion as we welcome Chris Anderson and Carl Bass to lend their latest insights into trends, strategies, and opportunities around specifically 3D printing with a discussion called The New Industrial Revolution, How Will the Future Be Made? We wish to thank SRI for hosting this program in their beautiful conference center. Chris and Carl, you are in very good company on this stage. Just a few who have appeared here in the past include Vannevar Bush, Mortimer Adler, David Packard, even Louis Armstrong. So thank you, SRI, so much. Please help me thank SRI. A brief introduction to the Churchill Club for our new guests in the audience. Churchill Club is the top independent forum for business and technology discussions in the Bay Area. Now in our 28th year, and what drives us every day is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through up to 40 programs that we present each year where like minds can connect and learn, connect with one another. And you have two more chances to attend Churchill Club programs before the end of this calendar year. Next week on December 13, our popular annual gadgets program is back just in time for the holidays with Wall Street Journal's personal technology columnist, Walt Mossberg, All Things D's, Kara Swisher, gadget geek extraordinaire, really, Greg Harper, and celebrity geek guest, Aaron Levy of Box. And they will all bring their favorite gadgets for a show and tell. And to cap off the year, on December 18, we present the future of publishing, which is about the self-publishing revolution with an all-star roundtable, including Guy Kawasaki, Barry Eisler, Clark Kepler, and Steve Piersanti. And then next year, we reconvene on January 16 up in San Francisco with a provocative program called Will Tech Power the Next Jobs Boom with a rock star panel of economists. So we hope you will join us for those programs that interest you. If you're tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you'll find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. And my last announcement, if you're considering joining or renewing your Churchill Club membership, now is an excellent time to do so. Attendees of tonight's program may join for just $99, which is a nice savings of $26. You can visit the registration table for information on how to sign up and other specials that are available to you. And please note that we are a nonprofit organization and your membership is tax, tax deductible. So let me now introduce our speakers. Carl Bass is CEO of Autodesk, a leading company in 3D design, engineering, and entertainment software. Carl's academic background is in mathematics. His avocational background is as a maker which could be defined as a do-it-yourselfer who enjoys tweaking, hacking, and bending technology and physical tools at his or her own will. And Carl actually has his own workshop in Berkeley, and he uses a variety of different physical tools and Autodesk's software portfolio to create everything from furniture to baseball bats for his son's little league team. And this preoccupation has earned Carl the unofficial title at Autodesk of Maker-in-Chief. <laughs> Chris Anderson is the co-founder and CEO of 3D Robotics, <coughs> one of America's leading drone technology companies. And today was Chris's last day as famously the editor-in-chief of Wired, which he led for over a decade. He's a tough act to follow there, having won several National Magazine Award top prizes for general excellence, as well as numerous nominations over the years. So what would make Chris leave his prestigious job at the top of his field for a do-it-yourself opportunity? 
because he believes, as he wrote about in his latest, his latest New York Times best-selling book called Makers, The New Industrial Revolution, that the time is nigh for the digital revolution to have an even bigger impact on the physical world than it ever could via the virtual world, that is the internet and web. So let's let Chris and Carl explain. Please give a warm welcome to Chris Anderson and Carl Bass. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening. And um, I, this is, uh, as you say, a, a big day uh, for me. Um, and it is an incredible privilege to be here on the SRI stage. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little awe-inspiring to know who else has come before here. And we had an opportunity to hear some of the things that came out of SRI from the mouse to Siri. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't already know it, you are in a, a magical place, which is the, uh, the, the, uh, the core, the foundations of many of the things that made Silicon Valley great. Um, so it's a privilege to be here. And to be here with Carl, my friend, and um, inspiration. Um, interestingly, uh, Carl, you're, you're maker in chief. My, I, um, as I went from editor in chief maker of Wired Magazine, I had to figure out what my uh, title on the masthead was going to be. Um, as I left, and I went with senior maker. Nice. So there you go. That's good. Um, you might you might work your way up to my <laughs> chief if, you, if this if this helicopter thing works out. <laughs> oh, it's going to be like that. All right. Exactly. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to continue a conversation we've been having for some time in front of you all um, uh, about what we think is the most exciting thing going on in the world right now. We're going to do that for about forty five minutes, and then we're going to take the um, next forty five minutes is going to be conversations with you, um, and uh, we'll have questions from the audience. Um, the title is The New Industrial Revolution, and basically Carl and I are here because we think that we are on the verge of something really big. Um, not, and when I say we, we don't mean us too, although we are part of this, but rather the United States, the world, um, perhaps the technology industry. Um, we think that, um, that uh, you know, 1977, the personal computer industry came out of the Homebrew Computing Club. That was a big deal. Um, 1993, the web you know, the democratization of communications, broadcast, that was a big deal. Um, we think the democratization of manufacturing is perhaps an even bigger deal. And um, I hope by the end of the evening that we have earned the right to call this a new industrial revolution. So let's just start by, by saying, okay, so, you know, we're tinkerers, we're hobbyists, we've got our workshops, etc. cetera. Um, how do we get off calling this industrial revolution? Industrial revolutions are, I mean, you know, the first industrial revolution just didn't make cheaper clothes. It tripled the population of the United Kingdom. It, ex it doubled the life expectancy of the Western world. It changed, basically, the world's, the, 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 the history of the homo, the, of homo sapien, the history of the human species goes, I'm trying to remember, I guess I gotta go left this way. It goes like <laughs> this for about, a, for about what, 50,000, 100,000 years or something like that, and it goes like that. And that little inflection point is called the Industrial Revolution. So it's a big word. How do we get off using this phrase? So I think, on one hand, it can be incredibly presumptuous. Mm. You know, we can start with the idea that, look, if this turns out to just be a hobby, if it's no different than reading popular mechanics and fixing your carburetor, then we were just wrong. You know, and we'll go down as kind of presumptuous and pompous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be called worse things, so it's, you know, it won't be the end of the world. I don't think that's true. Now, it's always hard at the beginning of these things to know, I mean, is this going to be a really big deal? But um, there's so many signs out there to me that this is a really big deal that I'm willing to take the risk. So let's talk about those signs. Um, we would not have this conversation 10 years ago. Right. Although Autodesk was in business 10 years ago and Wired Magazine was in business 10, year, 10 years ago, we wouldn't be caught talking about a new industrial revolution. Um, I can name three things that have changed um, that are sort of in my, in sort of the, to use the historical analogies, as important as the personal computer and the web. Um, and my three, you might have a different three, yeah. my three is, remember the personal computer was not the first computer. They were mainframes. They were owned by companies and universities and governments. And the personal computer was a pathetic, weak, little circuit boardy thing, but it was personal. And it was desktop. And it added those words personal and desktop to computing. And a series of tools, 3D printers, CNC machines, laser cutters, are adding the word personal and desktop to manufacturing. That's one. Number two, in all due respect 
to everything that Autodesk has done, but your, your, your past is $6,000 a seat yep. for professional tools that take you know, a, a university education. And my children are doing CAD on the web with free tools, yep. and they think they're playing Minecraft. Yep. So it's the democracy. So they, these, the, the software tools are becoming incredibly cheap and easy. And number three, um, factories. You ain't manufacturing if you don't, if you can't have access to a factory. In the old days, you had to own a factory. Today, you have, today you have cloud manufacturing. A factory is a click away. In the same way that you can send your photos to be printed at Shutterfly, you can send your 3D designs to be manufactured at Alibaba or MFG.com or whatever. Yeah. So those three, um, the desktop, the, the democratization of tools, and cloud manufacturing strike me as the difference between now and five years ago. So I, th I think you hit the nail. I won't try to up, you know, beat your <laughs> list of three. I mean, l let me just turn the lens to make it a little bit more personal. And I was trying to figure, I mean, because the important question to me, and I'm curious what your answer is on this, is so why now? Why didn't it happen, you know, 10 years ago? I mean, many of the same things were there. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I noticed on kind of a personal level is that, so why do I think of it as the next industrial revolution? Well, in the old industrial revolution, one of the things that you did is you made things in large quantities. And by, making, by having the means of production to make large quantities, you were able to get relatively high quality at low cost. Mm. All of a sudden, that's been kind of turned on its head. Yeah. And so, you know, it was great. A high school student, so by the way, you don't need to, he walked up to me and showed me what he had 3D printed. And so you can make things of very high quality. Um, you can make it in quantities of one or 10 or 100 and at reasonable cost. And if everything we know about how technology works, that cost is going to go down over time. So that's one of the things that I see going on is this ability to make things of really high quality. You know, it gets it away from the hobbyist craft thing. Well, so what you've done is you've just sort of said, OK, skills are not required anymore. In the same way that the laser printer and desktop publishing meant you didn't need to know how to typeset anymore, you don't need to how to run a metal lathe or a machine anymore. The, you know, the 3D yeah. printer does it for you. But you know, making two of something or three of something is not an industrial revolution. Right. And I would say what it, what it turns out, just like with desktop publishing, it wasn't you could hire every, I mean, none of us knew what font was a four-letter word, right? Well, we didn't know what a right. font was. I'm sure in your day job, you didn't hire everyone who could come and say, that's Ariel and Helvetica. There were a lot more skill involved. And it was different skills. Right. So I think what you've done is you've taken some aspects of it, and you've shifted it to something else. So instead, you know, so there's a huge amount of skill in going from the idea in my head to, first of all, making one, and certainly to making a thousand or a million. So I, th I think the skills have shifted. One of the things I, w in my answer to why now, one of the theories I, w I was playing with is, we now have an entire generation of kids who grew up with a different set of skills. They may have used Legos. Um, they're incredibly computer literate. Mm. Yet, they didn't grow up in the backyard fixing carburetors, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that whole thing of the hands-on, you, know, you know, the Sears Roebuck Shop catalog. Shop glass was wiped out. Right? No, you know, you no got rid economics. Of, yeah, so you don't, you don't have sheet metal, and you, don't yeah. know how to, you don't know how to weld, and you know, all the wood, wood shops. That's all kind of gone. And so now, all of a sudden, with these kind of tools, we've tapped into the skills that people have. Yeah. And, you know, you also have hit a time in which the cost has come down so that you can you know, be printing, you know, nylon fish line, yeah. essentially, for pennies. You know, um, we, we talk a lot about the power of bits versus atoms. Yeah. You know, bits can be transmitted for free. They can be copied. They can be manipulated. It's, it, you know, it, it, they have a unique physical properties. In a sense, what we've done is we've digitized the physical world. Absolutely. Um, whether it starts on a screen as a digital right. object, which can be traded, and then is, you know, maybe turned into a physical object on the desktop or the factory, or whether it starts as a physical object and then is reality captured, yeah. scanned in a sense, yeah. with, uh, now I have to plug Autodesk, they have a fantastic app, a free app on, on iOS called um, 123D Catch, which allows you to just use the camera to scan reality, photocopy it, turns into a mesh, and you can then print copies. Um, so, so the fact that physical objects now have the properties of digital objects is one reason why we're having this conversation now yeah. and not five years ago. Yeah, so I think this idea, I mean, it's one of the things I'm incredibly proud of, this technology that actually captures the world. Mm. And this idea, I mean, in so many ways, if you look at a lot of other stuff out there, o open source hardware, software, what we're doing is we're moving the starting line forward. You know, you get, you get to jump ahead. 
And in some ways, what this reality capture is the same thing. There's already an object out there. There's a piece of music. There, there's something else. In this case, there's a physical object that I want to start with. And this idea of catching and then modding and then printing is kind of an incredible thing. So, so I need to, this is the last time I'm going to plug yeah. your company. Um, so you know how I, um, Apple. You, you told me to do it three times. Okay, one more. <laughs> one more. That'll be in the Q&A. Um, so you know how when Apple came out with the iPod, their motto was rip, mix, burn, right? right? And this may not seem like mind-blowing at the time, you know, now, but it was mind-blowing at the time, right? Rip, that means to digitize, to take a physical object, a CD, and, in, and turn it into a digital object. Mix, to change it then burn it to manufacture a new CD in your own object. Incredibly empowering, changed the, changed the music industry, destroyed much of the music industry. Autodesk's motto is rip, mod, make. Yeah. What does rip mean? It means to capture reality, to take a picture of, to take these pictures of something, turn it into a mesh. What does mod mean? To change it. And what does make mean? It means to fabricate it yourself. Yeah. And to think that I can do for a physical object what I did to music, I mean, we saw what did the music industry. Is this going to destroy manufacturing? I don't think it destroys it. But I mean, it's in, I mean there are all kinds of interesting questions. So I had, I had something the other. I was down at the Giants ballpark with mm. my nephew. And we were outside, and he wanted, to, he wanted to go to the store and buy one of these tchotchkes. He wanted, you know, the Willie Mays statue. And I said, you know, it's OK, but that's what I did when I was a kid. Why don't we do this? Take out your phone, take a bunch of pictures. So we took a whole bunch of pictures of the Willie Mays statue. We went home. We uploaded it to the cloud. Back came a thing, and then we 3D printed his own Willie Mays. I'm sure I just incriminated myself in some well, terrible well, way. Well, 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 did you? I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know if so I did. No, by the way, the answer is no one knows. I, I, in the q and I'd be interested whether there's any lawyer in the room who can tell us whether Carl has broken a law right. in, in what he did. But I'm not sure whether I, you did. I'm not sure either. How many polygons is copyright infringement? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting question. As a matter of fact, hold on a second. Mm. They kind of put us in the wrong place. Oh, yeah. Here, hold on. Oh, this is so, not enough polygons to be copyright so infringement. So I see Chris <laughs> all the time. <laughs> This, this is my version of Chris, right? So um, Chris came by. We took a bunch of photos of his head. This, this, is, he, this is about a two-year-old Chris. Yeah, yeah. It's getting kind of... It's kind of getting... Uh, I have no more hair. A little, little ragged at the edges. But, uh, <laughs> but we, this, this came from a photograph, and we ended up with a 3D model that had accuracy to within hundredths of an inch. This one, as opposed to 3D printed, we went cheap with Chris. We actually cut it out of cardboard. So this is just laser cut out of cardboard and stacked in, you know, pasted together with white glue. But it, it's the scale of this thing that you can do. And you could have improved me along the way. <laughs> I could have. If I decided the years were too big or too small. I mean, and that's the whole mod. for the years. <laughs> <laughs> they always do. <laughs> you know, the hair's a cheap shot. Yeah, I know, I know. So um, <laughs> this one doesn't have much better hair either. Um, but it, but it, it's actually true on any scale. We're now able to capture stuff, you know, in this Internet of Things and sensors. We're doing it at the nano scale, yeah. but also on the largest kind of, ge you know, geologic scales. We're, we're able to capture stuff. And I think that changes where the starting point is for people. Okay, so that's one reason why we're yeah. having the conversation tonight and not five years ago, is that physical materials, things, yeah. now increasingly have the properties of digital information, of bits. So atoms are starting to act like bits. Right. Um, okay, that's, so that, that's exciting, and, that's, and that means that we can use these innovation models, the social models, everything the web, web has, has, has shown us can work, we can now apply to physical things as well. I would argue there's another reason why we're But there's having... a real equivalence there. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I mean, if, I, if somebody sees this tonight and in China wants it, I can send your file right. around the world. I mean, so there really is this real equivalence between atoms and bits. You know, and you've seen people experimenting, you know, so deep in the ocean or up in space or in the remote village of Africa, yeah. you can actually be able to, you know, on that cell phone, people will be 3D printing things. You know, so for example, I mean, they're very practical. So you see sometimes, you know, like Western innovation coming. Someone says, here's a way to clean water in the third world. And the thing gets there and it's probably a day and a half before it breaks. Right. And it no longer works. Well, what, went, what when you get to the point of instead of having to get your entire inventory of parts to there. Mm. You can just make your own. And yeah. so there's one of the villagers who now has, you know, he's the high priest of 3D printing, and he has the means to make whatever is needed for what's broken. So um, until 5 o'clock, <laughs> uh, I was in the media industry. <laughs> and I can tell you that the media, <laughs> the media used to be hard, right? I mean, to be the media industry, you, used to, you needed to own a printing plant or a broadcast tower. Right. That was basically it. 
And then along came the web, and now, and desktop publishing and everything else, and now publish is a button in your browser. What you're saying is that manufacture becomes a button in your browser. Yeah. And I think hundreds of years of industrial experience, PhDs, you know, unions, guilds, etc., turns into a button in the browser. Yeah, and, and what you're doing is, you, again, this is standing on shoulders. You're tapping into the internet, and you're tapping into the power of computing. Yeah. So this isn't, you know, it came out of nowhere. We're going to be able to do it, and you're either going to be able to hit it, and it'll come out on the thing in your house, or your friend's house, or a kiosk at the mall, or halfway around the world and be delivered to you. Right. And, you know, and so when we invented desktop publishing, yeah. that was a decade before the web. We knew how to make one of something, but we didn't have a, a platform to make many. The difference is that desktop manufacturing is emerging after the web. Right. And so we already have that, that, that collaboration platform. Right, and we're hugely connected. And so I can go and find the person who will make me a laser cut, and they'll flat pack this to me. But I also can tap into the whole real kind of commercial manufacturing. Yeah. There are people around the world who, you know, many companies have outsourced the making of parts to that I could only take advantage of if I was a large industrial company. Now I can, as an individual or a small business, tap into that same network. And that's why I say we're building, we're building on other stuff right. that's there. Okay, another question as to why we're having this conversation yeah. tonight. 3D printing, 20 years old. Laser cutting, 20 years old. Yeah. CNC's, 20, 20 years old. Every, your company, more than 20 years old. Why are we having the conversation tonight? I don't know. Rep you wrote the book. Rep rep. <laughs> you, uh, think, you think it started? I, well, think, I think what happened is that, is that we took your technologies, dude, yeah. and we meaning the world, yeah. um, rep rep. The reason I have a 3D printer is not because somebody has a patent on a 3D printer out there or, or all those great 3D printings. Is that somebody open sourced it, and it's called yeah. the RepRap Project, and that turned into MakerBot. And today my children grow up with 3D printers and make dollhouse furniture because somebody open sourced it and put it in the hands of people who were not intending to sell to design firms and, 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 you know, and, and big companies. And the reason I have a robot company is that somebody took physical computing yeah. and said, you know what, these like processors and like, you know, you know, the, the kind of stuff that's embedded electronics that's in all these kind of you know, fancy things around us, we should sort of make that easier. We'll call it Arduino. Yep. And, that, and now I'm in the robot business. And, and that's, I think, what changed it. We took industrial technologies and we democratized them. Yeah, there's clearly the democratization trend that's going on. And By the way, I didn't explain what RepRap was. RepRap was a, um, a, um, an open source 3D printer technology. Yeah. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me, it also seems like, you know, you're right, 3D printing is a 25-year-old 25 25-year-old 25 overnight success. I mean, I remember the first time I was directed to some warehouse in L.A. 25 years ago, and they showed me this thing, and there were lasers pointed into this pool of liquid, and eventually this thing, you know, Two days later, you got this thing that was this big. Um, but to, this, to the extent that the technology has evolved, it's amazing how 3D printing has captured people's imagination. So I think some of the other stuff is true, and maybe why the entire movement, if you will, is going to have more legs. But 3D printing has captured people's imagination. You know, it's, it's the replicator. Yeah. I can send something around the world and make it. This is, I mean... I love, you know, you know, in San Francisco in the gallery, people come through, and I say, this is 3D printing. Autodesk has a, um, a museum, if you will, of, yeah. of, of advanced manufacturing on Market Street. And yeah, it's, it's down there. It's open to the public. Come see it. And I love when I bring people by, particularly the ones who don't quite get it or are honest enough to say, so 3D, you 3D printed? And then you walk over and you say, yeah, it went down, you know, kind of a hundredth of an inch at a time, and it went back and forth, you know, a couple thousand times, and this is the thing that popped out of it. And there's something magical about out of nothing, as opposed to, I think, some of these other technologies are incredibly cool. Cutting with, cutting with a laser, cutting with a water jet, you know, you can cut through an inch of steel. Yeah. I mean, the more you do it, you go, that is a miracle. On the other hand, just out of nothing, or apparently nothing, this thing appears. And, and there's some amount of that, that narrative, that imagination being captured, that I think has contributed more than just to the feeds and speeds part of the other stuff. So if you ask what's really the secret of Silicon Valley, it isn't the silicon, right? It's, it's, it's putting in the hands of regular people. So it was the fact that the 
Apple II made it to regular people, and the Macintosh made it to regular people. I would argue on some level that it's more important that my four-year-old daughter makes dollhouse furniture with a 3D printer than that two decades of industrial designers made you know, race cars on 3D, uh, with 3D printers. Absolutely. The, argu the, the reason being that my daughter and a million other kids like her are going to think of things that the industrial designers did not think of. Yeah, I mean, the way we think about it at work nowadays, we walk around talking about you know, designing for nine billion people yeah. By 9 billion people. By 9 billion. You know, yeah. And so if you look out to 2050, you say there's going to be 9 billion people on this planet. 7 billion are going to be in Africa and Asia. Right. Um, it, you know, it's not Europe that's growing. It's us marginally growing. But it's about the 9 billion people contributing. And we kind of stumbled into this in some ways. You know, the history of the company was making professional software. Hmm. You know, for, for people who sat there all day long, it was the professional industrial designer or mechanical engineer. And it started out, I mean, th this is one of these things um, where two guys went off and said, we have, the, we have a piece of software that allows people to draw and sketch. And they'd been waiting for years for the arrival of a device. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the iPhone came along. And they said, this multi-touch device is an incredible device for drawing. And I'm, I always joke that I'm thrilled they didn't ask me, because I would have said, why would you ever do this? is the stupidest idea, wanting to finger paint on a device that's this big. It just doesn't seem like it's practical. I'm glad they, they told me about it. They didn't ask. And two days before they launched it, um, I saw this thing. And I still had that same feeling. And then they showed me some of the art that was done with it. OK, so fast forward. And now there are 15 million people who are using this app and doing incredible art with it. And, and now it's the tablet turned out to be. The now it turned device. out to be the tablet. You know, it's, it's moved, it's the mini, it's. But the thing that's interesting, so now we have built this complete line of software that's free, that is aimed for the rest of the nine billion. And the thing that strikes me about it, and this is you know, one of those proof points of what, you know, why is it real? So in 30 years of selling professional software, we sold about 10 million copies of software. If you compare it to everyone else who does the same kind of things we do professionally, it's more than all of them combined. So we were relatively successful. In two years of making software for everybody else, in giving it away for free, we have about 100 million users. Mm. And so, I mean, if you, if, you, if you just think about that, I mean, it really ju it just speaks to there was this untapped need out there that you often find in these places yeah. that nobody understood. You were never going to get it at $6,000. Um, and the combination of the right hardware came about with the right processing power at the right time. So this is the power of democratization. Yeah. Um, what happens when you put computers in the hands of the non-professionals, the yeah. amateurs, the people who did not have access to the, glass, to the glass room where the mainframes were, is that they do different things. Um, you know, the technologists invented TCP IP and HTML, and we, the regular folks who had published as a button in our browser, invented the web. Absolutely. We had new ideas, and we came up with the Twitters and Facebooks and, and everything else. Um, what, so, so right now, we, are, we, the newly empowered manufacturers, are making largely, um, you know, let, call it cheaper or slightly better derivatives of traditional manufacturing goods. Right. But at some point, we're going to have to, if this is going to be an industrial revolution, if we're going to earn our, our, our title, we're going to have to do a web, which is to say we're going to have to invent new products, new product categories, entirely new markets, that, these new, that my children and your children who are growing up with these things are going, to, are going to do for manufacturing what that generation did to media and disrupt it and create right, something but, new. I mean, what, you, yeah. but, but if you look back, wouldn't you say that every time we as a species invent a new technology, we mostly mimic the thing that went before. In, uh, and, and the first pass. Right, at first pass, you know, and if it becomes something successful, right. you, innovate, you, you innovate off there, you know, t TVs and movies or radio shows. So the first personal back. computers were worse personal computers, but they were more personal and right. cheaper. The first 3D printers were worse 3D printers, but they're more personal and they're cheaper. The first products, whether they're smartwatches or whatever, are going to maybe be worse, but they're right. going to be cheaper, but then they're going to be different. And those are the killer apps and whatever. So, when, when, so let me just ask you the same question everyone asks me. Yeah. Um, my children grew up with 3D printers. Right. I can see how the technology curve of 3D printers will make them cheaper, better, faster, yeah. you know, higher resolution, multicolor, et cetera. And everyone says, why would I want one? Why will every, every household today in America, more or less, has an inkjet? Right. 
Will every household have a 3D printer in X number of years? And if so, why? I don't know if they'll have. So I've thought about this a bunch. Mm -hmm. And I was thrilled to see, is it Staples who did it? Staples. Right, so it was Staples who just announced the 3D printing service. Because I always thought, you know, it was going to be Kinko, Kinko's FedEx or somebody would do this. Right. So that's the first start. So, the, so I think there's two different things. Will you have access to it? Absolutely. Do you need one at home? I don't know. Um, well, you know, when, when the first wave of, of fancy yeah. printers, well, first there were dot matrix printers, right. and then there were laser printers, then there were inkjets, and we sort of, okay, okay, I can kind of say why I need one to kind of print my dissertation or whatever, and then we invented digital cameras. Right. And then suddenly it was, that's why I want an inkjet, so I could print exactly. photos. So we haven't invented the digital camera yet, or yeah, have well, we? I mean, we're, we're on the verge of doing some of these things. I mean, so, but it, it's small. Mm. And so one of, one of the things that I think is also contributing, and this, this is the building on the web, is the sharing of information. Yeah. So I think back, I've been a maker my whole, you know, I've made machines, I've made furniture, boats, sculpture. But for me, as I was growing up, all the information in the world was captured, you know, in the Dewey Decimal System. Right. You know, so if I wanted to learn how to do something, you know, I'd get on the bus, I'd go down to the library, I'd, you know, go to that section of the library, there weren't many books there, and you'd try to find out how to weld or whatever. If you think about it now, and this access to information, if I have an idea for a weird project, in a matter of minutes, I can find people who took my weird and squared it, and that they're willing to talk to me about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can converse with them, I'll email with them. I mean, the sharing of information has been absolutely incredible. I mean, it, it, it has surprised me. Can I tell my story of my, my co-founder of my company now? Sure. Okay, so, so five years ago, I was not a maker. Uh, my grandfather was a maker. He invented the automatic sprinkler system, and you know, I spent my summers with him, and I admired him hugely. But he had like a machine shop, and he had like skills. He could work a metal lathe, and it was stunning. Um, I didn't have any of that, um, so I was the kind of the screen generation. And um, I started playing around. I, you know, I was trying to find cool projects for my children, and I got into Lego Mindstorms and robotics and things like that. And um, I realized that there was something going on really quite kind of interesting with smartphones. Um, I didn't know this initially, but I, what I knew is that sensors had gotten really cheap. Gyros, accelerometers, compasses, things like that. And um, it later turned out it was because of smartphones that the economies of scale of what's going on in your Apple and your Android phones means that you know, there's an amazing, and the Moore's Law has never moved faster than it's moving in your smartphone right now. Anyway, so I, I um, started with projects with my children. I got interested, they lost interest instantaneously. Your kids are much better than mine in that respect. Um, and then I started a, um, uh, I just started blogging about it, and I started a community, it's called DIY Drones, and we sort of like, you know, I bet like a smartphone, a smartphone could fly, fly a plane. Right. I bet a smartphone could fly a 747. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I'm more or less right, actually. I wouldn't get in that plane, but <laughs> I'm more or less right. Um, and, um, and so I started this community, and we started sort of saying, you know, you could have access to these amazing, you know, sensors, and they're chips, and they cost pennies, and... And um, there's this guy who comes on the community, and he's like flying a helicopter with a Wii controller with this Arduino. And um, I thought it was pretty impressive. He documented his work, et cetera. And I, his name is Jordi Munoz. And uh, the community builds. People start trading designs. They're like, hey, here's my PCB. Wait, we've been talking about physical stuff. Electronics work as, as well. There's things like, you know, the, there's CAD software for electronics. In the same way that you can send your, your CAD designs to services like Shapeways to have them 3D printed, you can send them to other services to have your, P, your printed circuit boards made and populated with chips. And you can, you, can have a, you can have an iPhone made, more or less, for you just by pointing and clicking in the right places. And so we started doing this. And... Um, then, we just, then, then people kept say, said, well, actually, it's very nice of you to send, send us the design files and so we can solder it together. But could you make it for us, please? And we said, okay, we'll start a company. And um, so Jordy and I started a company. I said, Jordy, if we're going to start a company, can I, I should probably know something about you. I've never met you. <laughs> Turned out that he was a teenager in Tijuana. <laughs> just graduated from high school. was 19. Um, and uh, I'm like, okay, let's see how this goes. He started on his kitchen table. Six months after it was on his kitchen table, he went on eBay and bought what's called a pick-and-place machine, which is basically a robot that makes printed circuit boards. And he bought it for $3,000, and he downloaded the, the manual on Google. And then I was like, that's impressive. Who knew? He built his... After, you, after, you, after, you, after the robot puts the pieces on the, the components on the, on, the, on the circuit board, you have to run it through an oven to melt the solder. 
and he had a toaster open from, from, uh, from Best Buy, and he put a little Arduino on it to time it. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I went down there um, about six months ago, and he moved from his kitchen to a garage, and he had a bigger pick-and-place machine, and he'd been in contact with the manufacturer. And I went down there six months later, and he had a factory. And there was this army of, like, people wearing our uniforms. I didn't know we had uniforms. We had uniforms. <laughs> we had these, like, lines of pick-and-place machines. We were running these, these four-head man corp, state-of-the-art electronics line. He's competing with China, and he's 22. Still hasn't been to college. Um, you know, moved across the border, you know, sometimes. Um, and that blew my mind. That's why I wrote my book. It wasn't, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to tinker. I didn't realize that tinkering had gotten, had gotten easier, and then going from tinkering to manufacturing had gotten easier yet. Yeah. So part of the reasons we're sitting here is that Jordi Munoz, a 19-year-old in Tijuana, could go from tinkerer on his kitchen table to a world-class electronics manufacturer competing with Boeing in three years. Yeah. Manufacturing is getting easier. And that, that sense of information of where you get your info and the community that shares it with you is, again, another thing that puts you one step further ahead. I mean, I was surprised. You know, we have that website, Instructables. Yeah. So, you know, it shows you how to do DIY kind of projects, and it's, you know, from cupcakes to, you know, thermonuclear devices. You've got one there, don't you? I, I have a whole handful of stuff on Instructables. And what surprises me is it's about 15 million people a month come there to share. And the will, having actually written Instructables, figuring out how much time is involved. And sometimes it takes me longer to write the Instructable than it is to actually make the thing. And the, th the thing that I found, and so, you know, as I watch through this and the community has grown, I'm going, what is motivating people to do this? And then I watch my own perverse be behavior in that I have a day job. I go in the morning, you know, just, you used to. Uh, he, by the way, he, got a new day job. He, he is my folk hero, you know. Go, <laughs> Tomorrow go, go, morning, I'll have, do new, this. I'll have a new day job. Be every but, but I go in the morning, and there's hundreds of emails. And some of them, by certain people's standards, would be considered very important. Yet, if there's one from an instructable yeah. guy, if somebody says to me, what did you do? Or I was like, and what, I, what I've been amazed about is kind of what makes me go all of a sudden gravitate is, is something that's generic to that community, in which I go, that is more important. We're, we're sharing something that's important to us, right. that's, that we have a passion about. And what's amazed me also is as we've done it, I will be making something, taking some photos, you know, with your phone that you kind of post there. And someone will say, I see that thing in the background, and it looks like it's a jig to do whatever. Why don't you write one on that? Because that looks even cooler than your real project. And I'm going, the amount of sophistication in this audience we've tapped into is kind of incredible. Uh, it's a sickness. Um, <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, I love doing projects with my children as well. Um, and... Um, I feel it's a real kind of father-child bonding moment. We make things. We just made, a, my son and I just made a Ramadan um, lantern with a Cylon light inside. We took a Cylon, you know, sort of one of the LED lights, and we put it inside the Ramadan lantern. It looks fantastic. Um, we had a great bonding experience. And, uh, and then we were done, and uh, he went off to play video games, and I got out the camera. And I was, I was documenting it for my instructables, and he caught me. And he said, Dad, you're not going to put this on the Internet. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I realized that my kids think that I'm only doing projects with them so I can be constructible. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, seriously, I, I love you. This is all about you. Yeah. No, I, I, actually, my, my kid has done a couple of them, but yeah. that's where it kind of falls down. So it, that, that, is, that seems to be a more adult aspect of this. The documenting like, part. Yeah, my kid yeah. is thrilled about the actual making. This thing about doing the next part seems to be a, a more adult fascination. Well, you know, I, I mean, we're a little old to be the web generation, and yet we're kind we of re reflecting web things. But I think there's, there's I mean, so, so documenting is kind of a very elaborate form of, of sharing and innovating and yeah. collaborating, et cetera. But simply posting your video on YouTube, I think yeah. that's kind of universal. Yeah. So, that's, that's, so you know, we, we talk about this new web innovation model, and we talk about open source and community, et cetera. But in a sense, it all derives from the one thing that I think defines the web, which is default share. If you do something, video it. it you know, if you didn't, if you didn't, if, you know, video, no video didn't happen. If you video it, post it on YouTube. If you post it on YouTube, share it. That those simple social conventions create an open innovation model that essentially, I think, is the future of the American economy. Yep, and I think it gives incredible. Act I mean, I mean, I think that's one of the underappreciated. You know, so back to your thing. I think the ability to share information 
with incredibly knowledgeable people is incredibly underappreciated in this because it would be a much more sterile environment if all the other things you said about the technology and stuff were true, but you didn't have this rich source of information. And you either had to go to the card catalog in the library or you waited for the publication of popular mecha mechanics exactly. to show up. And then we all had the same thing. I mean, th there's just a richness to the stuff that's out there. The other one that I think is interesting and even interesting to contemplate as you go forward, I don't think you're wrong at all in your analogy of the cell phone in that, you know, the cell phone, I mean, this, this thing is more powerful than the computer on the space shuttle. Mm. Um, it's, so that's one aspect of the computing power. The other part of the computing power that's interesting is probably through this device, um, I have access to more computing power than existed on the planet 10 years ago. Yeah. So just by having this mere phone, and so as you think f through this, you start going, what am I gonna be able to design with that? And so when you start saying, what's gonna be the killer app? We now have things out there where we have this vast amount of computing power. And everything about digital fabrication, about this ability to capture, actually comes about because of the computer. Right. And so I, I, I have high hopes that the kids who are growing up doing this now We'll find those killer apps. Exactly. So, let, so we have 10 minutes or a little less to, before we turn to Q&A. Um, we've described sort of, sort of, sort of three phases. Um, uh, the first phase was the um, uh, democratization of the technology. Yep. Regular people could make extraordinary things. The second phase was that we went from these little silos where we're all making things by ourselves in our workshops and our garages to doing things together. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we're all building on each other's work. So we, we, all, you know, we instinctively innovate faster because we innovate together. Okay, so we've now made it so that anybody can make anything and that everybody's ideas can now be realized. How do we get to industrial revolution? How do we make billion dollar companies? How do we bring manufacturing back to the United States? How do we you know, make the United States, and, and not just the biggest manufacturing um, you know, country in the world, but also maybe the biggest manufacturing employer in the world? So, I mean, I think both of us have been asked this a million times. Mm. And I, I mean, in the end, I have this really high hope that we will be able to innovate and create lots of companies. I, I, I see huge amount of evidence. So Kickstarter on steroids. Kick, but it, okay, so let, let's expand that. It's, Kickstarter is a form of access to capital. Mm -hmm. So if you go Kickstarter, Angel List, and a dozen other copycats, you go, there is, you know, plus the traditional ways, venture capital, I can get access to capital. And, and Kickstarter, actually, quick, quick show, show of hands, how many people in the audience have contributed to a Kickstarter project? <laughs> Terrific, okay, we don't need to explain what Kickstarter is. Exactly. Um, I would actually, I would actually argue with Carl on this. I, don't, I think the access to capital is like the least interesting part of, of Kickstarter. I think that the um, market research and community building is much more important. The fact is that most startups fail, but most Kickstarter projects don't fail. They may be a little bit late. Maybe their, their updates are a little annoying to you. Um, but we, we were having a big Twine discussion. It's, uh, <laughs> Twine's one of these Internet of Things things. I, I love the updates where they talk about their production problems. Carl just wants his Twine. Um, <laughs> But I think that the, the, the fact that Kickstarter um, has that threshold, and that if you don't cross the threshold, your thing doesn't get funded, it's great. Um, takes a lot of the risk out of manufacturing entrepreneurship. Yeah, so I, I, I think you, you're doing preliminary market research. Yeah. But, it, but my thing was, first of all, access to capital has become a much less... I mean, right. this idea of trekking down Sand Hill Road, with all due respect to Sand Hill Road, given where I am. Yeah. It, that, I mean, when I, you know, when I first went to raise money for a startup, you know, eons ago, you know, first thing I do is go buy a pair of shoes. And, you know, the second thing I had to do was, you know, go up and down and try to convince people who had no idea what I was talking about that this was a great idea. I can now find a like-minded community much more easily through these means. The second thing we talked about is this means of production. I can actually make the thing in a million different ways, right. either by having someone else have those tools, have the tools myself. And the third one was the, you know, these software tools that are out there, you know, mostly free or close to free that I, that I can get access to. Um, and, then, and then I have this computing power to help me figure out what I'm going to build, how I'm going to build it, understand how it's going to be before I'm... Before, I mean, this idea... So, I mean, just the idea of building digital prototypes instead of physical prototypes. I can understand how this thing's going to perform. In addition to physical... The fact is you can build a digital oh, prototype you, you, first and, you have to. and then a physical By prototype. By the way, I, even yeah. with access to... I do... It, 
so, interchangeably. So, so what you've described, I, all that's true. Um, you know, I used to live in China. I used to live in, in Hong Kong and, and you know, largely spent my time in Guangdong. And that's an amazing manufacturing yeah. you know, center. It's, it's not just the low-cost labor and the high, high engineering, but it's the supply chain, the critical right. mass of all the kind of stuff. Um, is, this, is the scenario we're painting here a way to compete with China? Can the United States, you know, you know, compete on the gl in the global manufacturing economy based on these principles? So, I mean, I think Steve Jobs famously said, "Those jobs are not coming back." You know, those jobs meaning the v low skilled jobs, right? So, very low skilled will migrate around the world to find the cheapest labor cost. And, and China's no longer it. I mean, right. now it's Vietnam or whatever. Right, and it, it, will, it, it will go to other parts of Asia. It will end up in Africa, parts of South America. Right. So the really low skill. Now, what I think is fascinating, when you're in China and you go to the, the big places that do, do the contract manufacturing, what's always struck me is the mix between high-tech and low-tech. Mm. So the beginning of the lines is those big, fancy picking machines that come from Germany and Japan that yeah. cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and right down the line is generally a young woman, yep. in, in, you know, in a, in a pastel uniform, um, you know, use, using an air-powered screw gun. And, and they're interchangeable because that operation has been optimized to br for minimal cost. Right. So I think we, when the operation is only going to be about minimal cost, I'm not sure that's where we're going to compete. Although, you know, there, you already see a backlash to the quality and uh, you know, the issues involve time to market to doing. China's getting expensive, and they're replacing their workers with, with robots, too. Right, and, you know, if you read recently, you know, uh, what I remember as being all the young women um, is young men now. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was that interesting article the other day that was describing kind of what's going on in the economics there. That's uh, this is the uh, cover of The Atlantic this month. Yeah. Um, where I think the United States has a chance is in the kind of innovation that, historically we've been very good at and famous for, which is we have the capacity to put things together in ways that are desirable, right. they, they, that the market wants it. We have a way to reach the global marketplace. I mean, there are not many countries with this kind of export economy that have products and brands that are known across the world. So this is the iPhone, what it says on the back of the iPhone, you know, designed in, in Cupertino or designed in California, manufactured in China. Right. That's, but, a, that's, but, a, that's, but, a, that's a positive future for America for you. Right. And one of the things is, as you know, if you've worked with the Chinese government officials, they, they'd like to reverse that. Right. I mean, they would like the high value work, you know, to, to, to move to China. But I think there's still this opportunity for high value work. And because if you do the balance of the equation, you can have more manufacturing here. We now have companies in the United States right. who are competing in manufacturing. Exactly. And I think, you know, in a sense that that, I mean, we already know that we can design things and get, extract most of the value, even if the production is done elsewhere. I think there's an opportunity to go further than that. Um, our first factories with, uh, we, by the way, this is, this is a drone, and this is the kind of stuff we make. Um, these are peaceful civilian drones with no Hellfire <laughs> missiles whatsoever. Um, um, but uh, we started in, Cal in, in China, and we brought it back to the United States, or North America, m m more precisely. And the reason we did it was that um, I think, and I'm, you know, I've experienced this quite viscerally, I think we're seeing a reversal of globalization. Absolutely. The, the first wave of globalization was what's called labor arbitrage. We went seeking lower cost labor. And we were willing to go as far as it, as it took. We were, we were agnostic to geography, thousands of miles for low cost labor. And then we started to realize what the cost of those long supply chains were. It was time, it was political risk, it was environmental cost, the carbon cost, et cetera, you know, containers and all that. And, and it was also we lost touch with the marketplaces that were actually consuming yeah. these products. So what we've discovered is that short supply chains are better supply chains. They're faster, they're more, they're more nimble, they're economically efficient, they're more in touch with, their, with, their, with the market, and they're more innovative. And the way we go from long supply chains, supply chains to short supply chains is automation. Yeah. The way we bring manufacturing back to the United States is not by lowering, labor, lowering manufacturing wages, but by in introducing more robots. Yeah, so if I look and I, and I think about our industrial customers, the largest manufacturers in the world, they are all going to something, some form of local manufacturing. So even when the company itself is global, they're going to local manufacturing. You know, if you look at, just take the car companies are a great example, yeah. where they all have a global footprint, but instead of these, you know, one factory and shipping it to every place in the world, 
what you see is happening. You know, and we, at first we couldn't, we scratched our head when people started building auto plants in Tennessee and Alabama or in South Carolina. Now we're finding out that at all those equivalent places around the world, companies are building it. And I think it's the combination of the short supply chain, but it's actually in understanding the end user market. You know, so you take a company like Ford. Their first, their first attempt at a car was to make one car that was identical and sell it everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Then they found out what was actually better to do was build a model that was tailored to that market. There really was a different requirement in Europe, in India, in China, and in the United States. Right. And so, yes, let, let's leverage the technology, let's build on that base, but let's build you know, local products for local markets. And you know, here in California, the notion of, of, uh, of local vores, sustainable you know, um, and, you know, production of uh, short supply chains, this is not just sort of a better products for the consumer, but it's better for the environment and, and culture as a whole. Um, I think we're probably ready to take questions yep. from the audience now. So there are microphones, um, I think, on both sides, if I'm not mistaken, microphones on both sides. Um, these are the, uh, the keepers of who speaks, so I'm simply going to utter the word next question, and they will decide who that actually means. Um, but um, please uh, put your hand up there, and we'll take them. Hi, so uh, let's talk about your four-year-old, because I have a five-year-old daughter. What happens when she starts using the software, and when is that going to change? What happens when she starts using the software? My my, you, you mentioned you have a four-year-old that... Yeah, yeah, when she yeah. uses the software, uh-huh. And what I found was that with one, two, three capture, it was lost her interest in like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a kid that can take my iPhone and start clicking forward. So she's taking pictures like there's no tomorrow. And she's still not moving from there to modeling. This is a kid that loves painting, sketching, Everything yeah. Yeah. is very comfortable with digital media, and yet the software UI interface let me, let me experience take the hot is not just, just, just for a second. When, when um, does that change? My four. Year, so I think it's a continuum. My four-year-old, um, the only thing she does is she downloads Dollhouse Furniture for Thingiverse, and then she just there's a slider on, on our on our cam software which scales it from big to small, and she decides how big she wants it to be. So she just moves the sky the, the slider, and then she presses. Print and then the three D printer makes it. My eleven year old, I cannot get him off Tinkercad. Sorry, Tink Tinkercad, a, a competing a competing web based uh, CAD software. <laughs> He's making castles and battlefields and mansions and um, he's obsessed. You know, this is what 11-year-olds do. So I would say that, you know, your child may need to be a little bit older to do CAD, but once they get into the Minecraft area, which is kind of a video game, yeah. kind of a crafting video game, once they get into Minecraft and The Sims 3, which is what my kind of 10, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds are into, they're in CAD. Whether they know it or not, they're in, they're in the CAD world. CAD's going to get a little bit easier, um, but right now it's easy enough for that range. Um, I, presumably, someday you'll be able to reach six-year-olds too, but we're not quite there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're there, but I mean, it, it also depends. I mean, I also think certain media appeals to certain people. Mm. Just as you know, today there are people, I mean, we're sitting here because we like making physical things. There are people who are perfectly happy being photographers. Yeah. You know, it's the difference. Some person was a painter and some person was a sculptor. Um, so, I, I, you know, and in some ways, I, I don't feel any compulsion to drive people so that everybody's kind of making the same kind of things. I mean, the most important aspect, so just stepping back, what I'm more interested in is the creativity and the imagination and the problem-solving aspects of this. All of these, in the end, are you know, tools to express yourself, to try to solve a problem. You know, some people are going to solve problems in the world through words. Some people are going to solve problems in the world by inventing things. So I, 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 know, I don't want to get back. I mean, this is one of my pet peeves against like education, where we somehow decided that everyone who's going to be high achievement students is going to learn calculus. As someone who learned plenty of calculus, I, I've had rare occasion to use it. Yeah. And so you look back on this and go, we don't, we don't need to single track people into whether it's making or anything else. This is about you know, opening up people's eyes and possibilities more so than you know, making it just mainstream. And just to just close this, you don't have to design a product in CAD to make it digital. It's simple, you can, you know, like you know, that, that Ramadan you know, lantern we made, that was like wood and tissue paper and hot glue. But then we videotaped it and we put it on the web 
and it became, in a sense, digital, at least conceptually digital. So there's, 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 there's lots of ways to be webby about manufacturing without and, starting with And that. I think a lot of it is motivation. So whether it's Thingiverse or Instructables, you, download, you, know, you can download plans to whatever if you just like the building aspect. You know, at some point, if it, if it motivates you to say, that was cool, but you know, in the same way people got tired of Legos and saying, I don't want to build what they tell me to build. I want to build what I want to build. At some point in which the motivation kicks in to do it, that's when I think some of the tools kind of, because every, every tool, whether a hand plane or a chisel or a soldering iron, has a learning curve and you have to climb over it. And what you need is the motivation of, I really want that thing to fly and I know I need to solder. Soldering in and of itself, not that interesting. Next question, please. Yeah, so you guys spoke a lot about the benefits of 3D printing in the future, but do you think you could speak about some of the concerns that this new industrial revolution might cause? I mean, what about when people can start synthesizing weapons uh, at very low rates and and what are the implications of that? Yeah, so by the way, they, it's already happening. You know, there's a, there are plastic parts for AK-47s already out on the web. I mean, there's a good... There's, they, they suck, by the way. Delaminated after two shots. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so we solved the gun control problem. By, by um, the way, guns are not hard to buy in America, as you may have noticed. Yeah. But, you know, what would be really scary, what if someone open source drones? That would... That would <laughs> totally irresponsible. Yes. No, I... By the way, these are technologies that are going to go everywhere. And by the way, there's a, there's a friend of mine, Mark Goodman. You may know, you know he, he's done a, he lives in the area. He's done a wonderful series of talks on, for everyone who thinks, you know, there's a, a utopic vision of the future, there's some smart criminal who's going to take every one of these technologies and apply them for something else. I mean, one of the first things he told me about when I was excited about these low-cost 3D printers were, were criminals who were using them to spoof ATM machines. Yeah in which they were putting it in front of the place where you put in your card, a plastic piece that fit on top of it. And so when it went to scan your card, it, it captured the card of the pin and wirelessly transmitted it. So I, I think we just have to be aware that this has always been true. It's going to continue to be true. There's nothing here that makes it. So I, I, I want to also respect your question because, because I think there are, you know. You think it, I disrespected his question? Well, I, I think <laughs> that we, we in Silicon Valley, we in Silicon, Silicon Valley tend to create technologies and not spend a lot of time thinking about the consequences. And that's kind of our job, right? right? I mean, we suck at understanding how technologies are going to be used. We kind of invent the technology, and then society figures out how it's going to be used. And that goes from biotechnology all the way to the computer. Computers can be used for good or, or ill, and so can the internet. Um, that said, you know, I think that it, basically it's not our job to figure out what the dangers are, but it is somebody's job. And um, let me give you an example. So we've been talking about 3D printing guns, which is silly, by the way. You know, you can buy a gun in Walmart. Um, we've been talking about drones. We've been talking about other things. Those are not the real problem. Um, I had lunch with um, Craig Venter, the biologist, uh, the other day. Craig Venter is working on a 3D printer that makes viruses, yeah. DNA and RNA. Um, you know, his his vision is that you know, so um, this the, you know, probably this season, many of you have gotten flu shots. Um, congratulations, that was a good thing. That flu shot is a guess. It's a guess at what the flu is going to be this year based on our best you know, epidemiologist's best expect expectation of what's, what, what particular viruses are crossing from the, you know, from the, you know, from across species, from pigs to humans to, you know, birds, et cetera, in China, and we'll eventually... They're wrong. They're wrong. They're hopefully not horribly wrong, but they're wrong. Because um, we're never right about, about, about that. Um, what if your doctor could send you an email, an encrypted DRM email, saying, um, actually the flu that's coming around this week is XYZ, and you just need to send that to your vaccine printer, and it'll print a little bit of, uh, a little bit of goop that you'll put in your orange juice. Um, now, that'd be better, right? But, you know, what, what could go wrong? Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, when that day comes, I'm not a big fan of DRM, but that might be a place yeah. to make an exception. <laughs> no, I mean, when you, I mean, just this whole idea of synthetic biology hmm. is one of the areas that I find most interesting as a matter of fact, one of the things that we don't talk about with 3D printing is, you know, limitations on size and resolution and speed and cost. Um, and one of the big problems is, is things go up as the cube, you know. So, right. you know, so if you want something twice as big, it costs eight times as much, it takes eight times as long. One of the answers that I've seen very successfully employed is biological means to grow things, which deals with exponential phenomena really well. We think of these maker spaces and tech shops and places like that, what we don't realize going on around us is there are 18-year-olds 
who have wet labs in their bedrooms, who are already experimenting. I mean, you can mail order DNA. There's this great conference every year called iGEM at MIT, in which people engineer organisms. They engineer bacteria. I mean, this, this, this is happening in real time. And, and so right now, there, there's, you know, you can, you, can, you can design any sequence you want and send it to these synthesis labs to be done. And they have this, like, database they look up to make sure it's not smallpox. Right. Right? And thank God they do. Right? Um, but, you know, what if, what if you don't need a synthesis lab? What if you have it on But your if you have your own DNA printer. So if you, if you buy a high-end photocopy machine right now, I'm told, and you'll probably know whether this is true or not, it'll check to see whether you're photocopying the U.S. currency and it'll like the water market or otherwise make sure you don't do that. And maybe tomorrow's high-end photocopiers will decide that this many polygons is too many polygons, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll stop you from doing that. I, I don't know. I kind of slightly hope that doesn't yeah, happen. And it, and it feels a little bit too much like, you know, kind of cryptography, the ciphering and deciphering. Yeah. You know, as, as long as there's a sufficient pot of gold or whatever at the end of the ring, you know, there will be people on both sides of that. Yeah. So, some for mere sport and some for the real rewards. And so I'm not sure we're ever going to get ahead. You know, I, I think it's a little bit too optimistic to think, yeah, we're going to invent, invent this technology that we don't know what it's really used for, but somehow we'll prevent people from doing bad you things know, with it. All we know is that, is that you shouldn't stop technologies before they exist. What you should do is you should cr bring them into existence. You should let people try them out, see how they feel about it. And then all, we as a society will figure out how, you know, how we want to regulate it. And, and the same thing with drones. You know, we, we create open source drones and we give them to anybody, including, say, Iran. Right, um, and we also invite in all the regulators, the FBI, the CIA, everybody to watch what's going on, so that they can do their job of protecting us. It's, we, we feel it's our job to inform the regulators, to let them do their job. Next question over here. Um, I was uh, trained as a mechanical engineer, so I've used uh, your software. How does this change uh, engineering education? If you're everybody's informed at the basic level on how to do these things, how does this change? You know what you learn in, in the university. I think it's a great question. So first of all, I love the fact that what I'm seeing around the world is that engineering educations are changing. And in some ways, they're changing back. I mean, and the things that I think are most successful are the hands-on experiential engineering. I mean, it's always, it was always interesting to me when they read engineering of actually building things. Because if you just wanted to be a mathematician or a scientist, you know, you're a physicist, you could go be that. Most people became engineers because they actually wanted to make stuff. And I think the most successful programs, you see some at Stanford and at Cal, places like Olin College, a bunch of places around the world, is they're putting that back into it. And I think that's really what motivates people to do it. I think there's a long gap, though, between you know, somebody downloading something off Thingiverse and printing it and really deeply understanding the physics and the math behind it or the science behind it to make something that hasn't been made before. So, I, you know, this, this is a big continuum. And I, and I think what that allows you to do is take on projects that are harder. Now, I don't think it's reserved for, any, you know, your diploma doesn't guarantee you that you invent something cool. There's, you know, there are two kids, you know, one kid in Tijuana, you know, and one in Abu Dhabi who may do better. And I, and I think that's a beautiful thing. But I do think it gives you the tools. And, the other thing, having made things for a long time, you know, this is a little bit other than that theory of 10,000 hours. I've never made anything the first time that I'm happy with. It's usually about the third or fourth or fifth time that you start having it. If you've done anything for long enough, you know, probably when you've done it the 10,000 hours or you've worked on it for 10 years, you feel you finally get that sense of, a, you know, expertise that I really know how to do it. So I think in some ways it gives you just a different tool set to solve different problems. The fundamental instinct is the same. I'm going to take a slightly different uh, approach on it. You, you probably have a, you know, a, a university degree in engineering, if not, if not more, if not a graduate degree. Um, I'm going to argue that your skills are becoming universal skills, that you won't need a university degree to do many things you've learned to do. Um, you know, when you look at things like... Um, Take publishing, for example. Publishing, you needed to, to be a professional to do it, and you need to learn typography and all this kind of stuff. Then we got desktop publishing. We all kind of got access to fonts and letting and type and kerning and all this, and we made a mess of a page, right? Dog's breakfast of fonts. You did horrible things, but we got better at it. And then publishing became a button that anybody could use, and we all became publishers. And, and we started to care less about the process and more about the product. I think the same thing's going to happen to design and engineering. When I look at my 11-year-old doing CAD, and you know he's learning words like ch like like chamfer. Am I even yeah. pronouncing that right? Yeah. Chamfer, yeah. chamfer, and, and and fillet and things like that. And these are kind of technical. But it's not fillet. 
It's not filet, right? <laughs> so in the same way we learned like like kerning and letting, you know, from desktop right. publishing, we're now letting chamfer and 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 and, and fillet. And um, and he doesn't care. He doesn't want to know that this is you know architecture language or design language. He just wants a curve on his on his on his castle. And um, and he's empowered to do so. And so he's he's getting he's becoming a designer without thinking without thinking that he's becoming a designer. And in a sense, you know, if we can take words like engineering and design, you know, and sort of abstract them in the same way we've abstracted publishing, and people let just people make stuff and make it cooler, then we've probably done our job. And in a sense, as things become mainstream, they became become less sort of specific. So like in the same way that a robot is like a machine that is not mainstream. The moment it becomes mainstream, it's not a robot anymore. It's a toaster. Artificial intelligence is stuff we can't do. The moment we can do it is not artificial intelligence. It's voice recognition. Engineering, as it becomes mainstream, isn't engineering anymore. It's just using cool tools to make awesome stuff. Next question, please. So we've talked a lot about really interesting technologies. Um, so uh, 3D printing, reality capture. But we're still, I think, in the early days of this transition. If, if you can't forecast for it, can you start to put timelines in terms of when this becomes mainstream and, yeah. and maybe key inflection points as tipping points along the way? So, so the first thing I'd say about all of the, I mean, we've talked a lot about the 3D printing. And I think this additive manufacturing captures the imagination. But if you just use the idea of digital fabrication more broadly and say, what we're doing is software-controlled manufacturing. The first thing I think you're going to see, and you're already seeing some, is where people are doing low-volume, high-value applications. So you see people 3D printing um, hearing aids, prosthetic devices, um, um, orthopedic devices. So it has to fit me. There's only one of them in the world that needs to be done. I think as you look out over the transition, it's as we start being able to make more and more of those things as these things become popular. Um, someone showed me the other day, they were actually using, it's somebody I, I ran into the other day, they're now doing custom headphones, the ones that fit in the ear, mm. and they're using catch to do it. Yeah. So all you do is you, you, know, you use your cell phone, you do this, and they're 3D printing headphones. I've heard of people going out trying to do printed 3D cell, uh, 3D printed cell phones. So I think we'll go through this transition of really low volume, one-off, something special for me, until we go high-end manufacturing. And you've already seen companies, you know, like Nike. I don't know if you've seen, but they have a shoe called the Fly Knit. Mm. It, it's a CNC weaved machine, and it starts with a sole, and it's weaved, and now it's only a handful of places. Doesn't take a leap of imagination to say that that CNC machine is down at the mall. That you do the equivalent of Nike ID online, and you go down and pick out your custom designed shoes. So I don't think we're all that far away. I mean, I think that future is almost here. If you go to the dentist, I mean, half of you in the room have probably already done this. If you get a custom uh, crown made or like one of those called Invisalign, um, you know, invisible braces that kind of move your teeth over with a series of, of, um, of uh, retainers that you wear, those are all 3D printed. Yeah. Um, I would say that we're, so it, to use my historical analogy, if, if 1977 was the personal computer and the Apple II and 1984 was the Macintosh, we're about 1983. So in other words, the technology is out there. It's about to go mainstream. It's now just kind of in a box. It works. You don't need to be a geek anymore. You can use it. So I, I, I think that we're, uh, we're at the beginning of the mainstream moment. I think it, it, as a homework assignment, yeah. <laughs> how many people in this room um, um, uh, when they were growing up, their parents bought a home computer, right? Okay, think about that. Your parents bought a home computer, probably cost about $2,000. They weren't sure why they were getting it. They were clear, it, was, it felt it was part of a child's education, maybe one of those 21st century skills. You could program it, we knew that. And, and they never figured out what it was for, but you guys figured out what it was for, and that's why you're here today. This holiday season, if you have children, I think it's time to consider that instead of the home computer, you get the 3D printer. By the way, I think, Replicator 2, I think 3D it, Systems Cube. I think it's going to be under Christmas trees everywhere. So I ran into Bree the other day, yeah. you know, maker bot guy. And he, he said to me he's making 200 a day. 200 a day. Okay, now, the quick survey. How many people in this room have used a 3D printer? Good. How many people in the room own a 3D printer? Good. <laughs> How many people plan to buy a 3D printer this holiday season? <laughs> Yes! All right. Your children will thank you. Right. Next question. 
Um, so in, uh, when we go into mass market, like in 10 years, do you think the main usage is going to be more replication of things or creation of things? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's going to be modification. I, I really think it's going to be this thing of taking stuff. But that probably is what he meant by replication. Did you mean, by replication, do you mean exact copy or modified copy? Um, something that someone else designed that you may be customizing, but you're not kind of inventing. I think there's a lot of that. I think there are many people who don't, you know, I don't think, not everybody is a designer or wants to be a designer. It, you know, there is a real skill there. Um, I think a lot of people like customizing, modifying, changing. And, you know, you, sometimes you see it like out of places like Ikea, which okay. I learned tonight I pronounced wrongly. But I know. Uh, I Ikea? So Ikea. We, have, we have our Scandinavian friends at Ikea. <laughs> I've corrected Chris and I on this. But, you know, taking these low-cost things that you can take and modify and make them more suitable for you, I think that's going to be one of the big uses. If you had to guess, I'm just yeah. we're we don't way know. out we don't of know anything about here. If you had to guess, what fraction of pages that come out of your inkjet at your home are replicated versus created? What would you guess? More replicated. You think more replicated? I would totally say more. In our house, we, we print a lot of photos and things. Yeah, I, I'm actually thinking, no, it's my kids' papers. Right, you know, it's Re all, that's it, created. It, it's all that. I mean, the only thing, actually, the only thing we print out occasionally, I mean, it's very, I think I, I was wrong. It's 90% created, it's 10%. You know, somebody sends me something like, I got a sign and fax. Okay. That's how outdated So there you is. go. I mean, it, it, you know, so he gave you one answer was intellectual, another answer, yeah. which was actually based on his real life. <laughs> exactly. Do you believe his words actions? <laughs> that was, that was a, that's the failure of a mathematician. Busted, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Should have been a scientist. Hi. Um, hello. So being that this is the United States, I can't help but think that the first time someone fires off an AK with a plastic part that sheds random hot bits of plastic all over them, that they're going to sue the person who made the file that they printed to make the AK part. And does that mean it's really best to just keep your drone operations in Tijuana? Uh, because there's going to be oh, some sort of right. like uh, legal arbitrage and that, that the whole thing will just quagmire in the United States? Or, um, and do you think that maybe there are, have already been legislators that might act to sort of stem that off because they think it's a valuable thing for them? So Chris, as a new CEO, encourage it. Right. as a new CEO, I'll step in and do what you did for me. And, it, and uh, just, just take one stab at it while you think of your carefully prepared CEO answer to this question. <laughs> Oh, he's saving me from my jails term right now. Exactly. He, 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 you know, it's first day on his, he hasn't even started yet. Um, look, I, th I think there's going to be a litigation in a huge number of these areas. I mean, we, we went on one around intellectual property about that. I mean, someone saw it the other day with intellectual property about three, three, um, 3D printing devices and the lawsuit with it, that infringed upon the 3D printing actually included a lawsuit against Kickstarter as providing the funds for it. I, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a really misguided effort. But, I mean, the beauty of the American legal system is you can sue anyone for everybody. Right. One place I've thought about this particularly, and then I'll let Chris answer the real question, was I've thought about this with the Google cars, you know, the autonomous vehicles, whether it comes from Google or someone else. I think the thing for all of us have to wrestle with is I think we will demonstrably prove that Having robotic cars is safer than us driving when we're drunk, when we text, yeah. when we do everything Humans else. Humans should not operate heavy machinery, drunk right. or not. Right. <laughs> and we will find out that it's demonstrably better. The, the test for us as a society comes when the headline reads, robotic car kills pregnant mother. And we realize, look, a tragedy occurred as a result of the robotic car. But in the aggregate, we've probably saved some orders of magnitude 35, more 35,000 people a year die in traffic accidents in the United States. It's definitely going to be fewer in the robotic future, and yet robots will kill people. What headlines and people are we will see? And people will flip out about it. And, yeah. and I think that's really the acid test of who we are, whether we recognize that or not, what's the right thing to do. So thank you for letting <laughs> me sure. uh, you know, uh, compose my thoughts on this. Um, uh, so we're an open source um, a company, which is to say that we put technologies out there, we give them away for free, we give them without warranty, without, you know, without, with no, no guarantees whatsoever. And people can use them for ill and, or for good. They, we don't get, certify them without bugs. They have bugs. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we promulgate good practices. We teach responsible use, etc. Sooner or later, somebody's going to use one of our drones to do something stupid. I'm not even going to speculate on what that stupid thing is, but you, know, you can imagine 
what that stupid thing is, or dangerous, or, 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 or malicious, or something like that. Um, and there's a non-zero possibility that, you know, my children will wave goodbye to me as I serve 5 to 10. Um, I think it's probably not going to be because I broke a law. I think it's because somebody, because, because a bad thing happens using our technology and some congressman decides to make an example of me and, and, and is outraged that the law has allowed this technology to get in the hands of bad people and they just throw the book at me. And I'd be, you know, and, and so 5 to 10. That's a non-zero possibility. I'm assuming it's very close to zero or I wouldn't be doing this, <laughs> but, it, but it is non-zero. What am I going to do, right? Am I going to not do this? Am I going to spend you know, tens of millions of dollars get with law and lawyers, kind of you know, minimizing my risk? Am I going to ask the regulators you know, what they think? I, ha I have asked, by the way, they have no idea. You know, we are in uncharted territory here. It's not like we're, we're conspicuously breaking laws. It's like the laws have not been written in this space, and so too for 3D printing. So uh, it's a Silicon Valley. You know, we don't, we don't wait till everyone gives us permission. We just do stuff, see what happens, try to minimize the risk, deal with the consequences. Um, you know, I'm hoping that we've minimized enough of these risks between, between our, you know, our understanding of the law as it is, our, our use of open source principles, our offshoring, our, you know, interneting and all this kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, bad stuff's going to happen and, and I'm prepared for it to be pointed at me. And um, I'd like to believe that at the end of the day, people can say, at least I behaved responsibly. At least I did it transparently. At least, at least uh, transparently. At least I brought the regula regulators in to the process. At least I informed those who are charged with protecting us on what they should be doing to do their jobs better. So I may have made mistakes. I may have broken laws. But I'd like to. I'd like history to show that I at least acted responsibly in in in, in acting. Yeah, so. And I, you know, having sold tools, you know, for a long, you know, built and developed and sold tools for a long time. I've confronted this all along. We're saying people use it every day for both good and bad. Yeah. And, and when you say to yourself, so what's the answer if you decide? I mean, the only choice you give yourself is not to, is not to make them at all. I mean, because... It's not what we do. Right. And, and you really can't in some ways. It's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. And is really the right answer to say, we're not going to make it at all. And I don't want to be apologist you know, for this utopian future in which technology solves everything. But you know, having confronted it head on and thought long and hard about it, you know, when a government agency not, you know, knocks on our door and says, do you think these missiles were done with you? you know, and what could we do to prevent that in the future? You recognize very clearly what your, what your technology is being used for. But the only real decision you can make is not to do that. And you go, for every one of those, I can find a hundred of the others. Right. We just tend to push things into the, into, the, into the public, push things into the open, and let people smarter than us decide what to do about it. Next question. Um, over here. So, so we, right now we think of drones as being military devices that, that shoot missiles at people. Um, um, but the, you know, the internet was a military device. Computers were a military device. Um, you know, that's what happens with technology is the GPS was a military device and, and then, it, then it democratizes. Um, I think you know, what we know is that the technology, the underlying technologies of sensors and processing and cameras and wireless are falling fast enough that, 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 they, that economically and technologically the sky can be dark with drones. What we don't know is what they're going to be doing. Now, you know, um, let me give you an example. Um, so you and I were talking earlier about agriculture. Um, it turns out that it's really hard to know what's going on on a farm. And we don't have actually sensors on So if you go up to Napa and you go to the vineyards, they can drive around the roads and they can kind of see that, you know, what, the, what, the, what, the, what the vines on the, on the side of the road are doing. And they can kind of step up a little higher and sort of see what the next row of vines, and they have no idea what the rest of the vines are doing. And so they like overwater. They use way too much water because too much water is better than not enough water. And you know, they kind of scatter fertilizer everywhere and pesticide everywhere, and they kind of over-engineer their farm because they have no idea what's going on. Um, with a, every now and then, a high-end vineyard will hire these dudes with these like six-foot Yamaha remote control helicopters to survey their, their vineyard. And it's like crop dusting. It costs $1,000 an hour. They come up with this truck, and they like fly over their crops. Mm -hmm. They take a picture, and they stitch together the pictures. And they're like, a friend of mine just did this. Dude, you've got a marijuana plantation in the middle <laughs> right. of your vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, who knew? Right. Right? <laughs> Turned out that late at night, these, these like, you know, pot growers would come yeah. in and like, like, you know, 
tap off your irrigation Petition. system and move your fence a little bit. And there was this like yeah. pot plantation there. And so like farmers know nothing about their crops. So um, I think that you know, in the not distant future, five, five to 10 years, you'll drive up through Napa and you will see these little guys flying over the vineyards and other crops every day, doing multispectral imaging to try to get a sense of what's going on. You know, are these plants getting too much water? Are these not enough, et, et, et cetera. So that's one surprising application. I'll give you one more. Um, this particular baby is designed for, um, uh, for a, a little device that we're coming out with called the Follow Me Box. And the Follow Me Box is this little box, a little sort of phone size thing that you wear when you're, you're windsurfing, that you wear on your belt. So this thing on the front right here is, uh, is, a, is a GoPro camera. And GoPros are really good for extreme sports, um, you know, or any kind of sports uh, photography. So windsurfing and, and any kind of water sports are one of those things where it's actually kind of hard to get close enough to get a good shot. What you really want is to be like 30 feet behind and 30 feet up. This great aerial shot. It's actually quite expensive to hire a helicopter to, photo, <laughs> you know, to video you doing this. So what the follow mix box does is you just go out there. You're windsurfing. I'm not a windsurfer, so I'm probably going to use the wrong language, but you're, you know, you're you're, you're, you're doing well. <laughs> you are standing up, and the wind is going, or you're kite surfing, and you're in the air, and you're feeling good about it. You push the button. The drone lifts off from the beach, comes out, positions itself 30 feet behind, 30 feet up, and just follows you as you do your thing, video, videoing you, you. And then when the battery gets low, it flies itself back to the beach. So, you know, you may, you know, in the same way that we'd like, you know, five years ago we didn't see kite surfers on the bay, now we do. Now we're going to see kite surfers and drones. Right. So, so, so as we, the word you were looking for was planing. You're planing, up, you, you get, you. But, <laughs> uh, and, and it, would, it would actually be great. I'll give you another example where um, two of the things we talked about tonight where we, we, we saw these drones and we had this ability to capture reality. Well, it's great to do, you know, Chris that's willing to sit still. All of a sudden we, we said... What could we do? And so we've been working with a, a friend of mine, Louise Leakey, who's... Um, a friend of mine, Louise Leakey. She is. Yeah, does do you anyone know, know who Louise Leakey is? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. World famous anthropologist, Just, archaeologist. Right. Uh, daughter, granddaughter. Granddaughter. Of famous, of, uh, of famous fossil finders. They're, they're, and she's been now using drones to go look over large por portions of land to actually find where they might find fossils. That there, are, that there are surface clues as to where are the best places. And so they're looking over huge land areas, and so they're going and surveying this. We also took it and we used drones to go take pictures of buildings. So, for, you know, you, you could build a nice model from walking around a building, but if you really want a 3D model of an existing building, you, you would need to do something like that. Um, and so I think the application of this stuff, what has surprised me, and this is kind of what we're getting at, the creativity of the community is amazing. So one of the things we found out with the ability to put photos together into 3D models, um, not our idea, somebody recognized that these photographs didn't have to come from the same camera hmm. with the same lens or taken at the same time or place. And so somebody wanted to rebuild a Buddha that had been destroyed in Asia. And there was no way to, it no longer existed. And they wanted to build something from the past. And so they went up to places like Flickr. They crowdsourced all the photos. And they recreated an accurate 3D model of the Buddha that no longer exists. And as they go to rebuild it, they will build, you know, an exact replica of what, of what was there before. Next question, please. Hi. So, oh, oh. So uh, I'm the CEO of Taipei Machines, and I'm sitting next to Brooke here, who's the founder of PrinterBot, and we, we will build 3D printers for those of you looking for Christmas gifts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my, my, I, have, I have two, two stories uh, for you guys. Uh, one's picking up on the, uh, the, um, the challenges of 3D printing, and I, I actually took a 3D printer with me to Europe uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, through the airport, and uh, you know, there's nothing to stop me to print... Uh, a la you know, shark with lasers on it uh, in the uh, in the airport uh, terminal. There's, there's there's no rules or anything there. So, you know, yet another thing to be worried about, guys. Shark with lasers um, is the new euphemism. For it's the new it's the new machine yeah. gun. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, my my question to you guys though is, uh, we we've, we've got uh, Chris. You mentioned this this parable of 2D printing, where you know it's become easier and easier, and you, you get more and more printers at home. Um, but, uh, Carl, one of the problems we have in the industry at the moment is um, it's very easy to use 1, 2, 3D catch to get objects into you know, the, the cloud. 
but it's actually harder to get them from an STL file or an OBJ file into the 3D printer. Uh, right now with the software there's no print button and that's the big difference between a, a Word file format and, and, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, the 3D printer. Yeah. So my question to you is really just when are you going to interface with us? When, when do we get the print button? I'd be happy. Industry? So one of the things we did, so one is I would say one of the things that's been good in this community and everyone knows, for those who are really involved, people understand the limitations of these open file formats like STL. But STL and OBJ are out there and they work most of the time. I mean, the hardest thing is to get these closed meshes, you know, to get closed surfaces. So one of the things we did is we made a free piece of software called 123D Make that is for different kinds of, you take your objects, it will make it watertight, which is the requirement for 3D printing, oh. and it will do things like go to your printer. So we've integrated with a bunch of 3D printers. We've done it with um, ShopBots. We're, we've done it with laser printers, and it will also do some of the fabrication techniques, like so in this one, so th this went from one, to, so it was a mesh, it was an OBJ, got, it, it got sliced, and then went out and got, you know, into a different file format to get sliced. So we, one, two, three D make, which is in its early stage, you know, we released it this year, its entire purpose in life is to get from when you have a model to the device you have access to. So I, I just used the one on the iPad, and that just is just does laser cutting, just does 2D. Uh, but you're saying, yeah. you're saying there, there, the, there's the, one on Windows and there's Mac. There's one on Windows that does it does 3D as well. Yeah, and it does all the slicing. It'll make waffles. Slicing, I knew. I was, it's more like his question. No, no. no the, the most important thing I think it does in there is make watertight models. It closes the mesh. Okay, yeah. good. Close the mesh. It's come to that. Yes, we, it's we're now close in, the mesh. Yeah, and now we're talking. So I guess we're closing the mesh. Okay, last. We're, we're, Okay. Okay. Good. I'll be here. Last question. Um, so I'm with Nike, so I owe you for the corporate plug. Now. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I guess my question, I'll keep. I'll it, turn on my light. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep. I'll keep my question short. As you know, somebody who knows plenty about the overextended supply chains and kind of the kings of the old way of doing anything, um, I guess my question would be: Do you see any, or what role, if any, do you see for the kind of entrenched players that have really perfected and optimized in that old model? And is there I think with Flynet is a great example of there's certainly endless possibility of, of a kind of mass customization and, and unique product, but do does the old guard in some way maybe inherently stand in the way of that eventual democratization? I mean, I think the obvious, I mean, this is innovator's dilemma, you know, writ, writ large. Now, I mean, to, to the credit of Nike, I mean, I think many of the people in the Nike leadership team have tried this experiment to say, what would Nike be without the factories? You know, so just as a thought experiment. Now, I think many companies do it. And you know, if you really grok the innovator's dilemma, it's not the lack of understanding. It's the inability to respond you know, as a rational response to the damage it'll do to your business. So I, th I think in many ways, you look at things like the fly knit and the idea that I can take this CNC made machine and I can stick it into the shredder and the material that comes out, I can feed back into the machine to make it again is an incredible idea. Whether or not there will be, you know, kind of, you know, the corporate wherewithal and, the, the, and it makes financial sense to do. I think every company goes through that. But there is no doubt that Nike as well as all the others are going are to fa face this problem in a big way. So I'm going to actually uh, uh, answer the opposite. I, yeah. I disagree with you. Um, uh, so um, well, I wrote my first book was called The Long Tail. And it was about how the you know, sort of democratized access to distribution was going to create this you know, new class of niche products. It was going to challenge the blockbuster. Everybody misunderstood it. Everybody thought it was the end of the blockbuster. It wasn't. It was the end of the monopoly of the blockbuster. You know, today, we still have mainstream media. YouTube didn't kill Hollywood. Um, there's a place for both. And I think what we're seeing is the long tail of stuff. What we're seeing is those markets of 10,000. 10,000 is like a magic number, right? 10,000 is too small for you, right? You don't get out of bed for 10,000 units. And it's too big for an individual. It's the kind of, it's the, it's the, it's the dip in the market. And what we're talking about tonight creates markets, creates products that can fit markets of 10,000s. And some of those 10,000s will be the next Nike. And many of them will not even get to 10,000. But the point is that that's an unexplored market. And that's where the new industrial revolution starts. Thank you so much. Thank you all for Thanks, coming. Everybody. We have, uh, I believe we have uh, Chris, co copies Kyle. of my book, uh, Makers of the New Chris, Industrial Chris. Revolution, outside. And Carl. Hello.
Thank you. I think we're supposed to sit <laughs> down. We're supposed to sit down. Someone else is supposed to say something. We would like to thank you very much <laughs> for sharing your perspectives and insights so candidly. Let's thank them once again. And please accept this much coveted Churchill Club speaker t-shirt as <laughs> a token of our gratitude. Thanks again to SRI Thank for hosting this program and Chris's new book, Makers, The New Industrial Revolution is available for sale in the lobby, courtesy of Books, Inc. And Chris has kindly agreed to stick around for a while and sign your copy. And of course, it would make an excellent holiday gift as well. Right next to uh, the maker box the, the <laughs> or the printer box. And the program, this program is going to be on view on the Churchill Club's YouTube channel within the next 24 to 48 hours, so please do share that. And you have been an amazing audience. Thank you so much. See you next time.